caller if you hear me and welcome to thursday night my corner of youtube land ladies and gentlemen it is the top of the hour 10 p.m eastern we are here continuing on with this theme of star trek i do believe today is also star trek day which i did not know before i just came across doing star trek women at the beginning of the week when i just thought hey i know the orion slave girl famous hot woman i've drawn her before but uh i mean i've never drawn her before i've drawn other star trek women's uh, seven of nine and all that but i thought hey why not go and uh finally get around to that so this is what built up and built up throughout the week and now we are finally doing miss counselor Choi from the next generation which is a bit interesting because of course the today we got to see or as it was reported the passing of queen elizabeth 96 also the longest running monarch. So it's an interesting coincidence that I choose to draw Counselor Troy right here. The, of course, the, your typical English lady, your Tolkien English lady on Star Trek, on that Star Trek show. They didn't have a British actor in the main cast, but certainly more, you know, it's, it's more classy if you put a Brit in there. It builds them up a lot more. So this I see, I see, I see. So now we're going to go in and see more people coming into the stream. Something else I want to bring up. I did not bring it up last night. So here, just to show you the progress of uh, yesterday, my regular color pencil sketchbook piece. There's the Girls of Canada issue that was part of the Playboy supplies that uh, Nick sent me a few weeks ago. Girls of Canada. And I thought that was Dorothy Stratton. This is not Dorothy Stratton. This is a Canadian model of October 1980, and also uh, E.L. Doctorow, new fiction from E.L. Doctorow, to whom I'm not familiar with the author's work. Usually when you see an author that has initials like that, it usually means that they're a woman and they're using the initials to kind of cover it up. And yes to one of my new regulars, Dead Punk Gage, oh Canada, which I'm about walking distance from, I think, or maybe driving distance from. Let me get the piece in here, try to frame it. Put the hand in there. Oh, yeah. We got it framed up. There's the piece I did. We've got Vagabundo Devon. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, the road dog Jesse James and the badass Billy Gunn reintroduces to all of you Vagabundo Devon by the New Age Outlaws. You're damn right. Oh, you didn't know somebody. Yo, ass better call somebody. I see Relentless is here in the chat, so... Yes, Relentless, this is the latest uh, piece for my regular Wednesday color pencil skit. Yes, those uh, color pencil, uh, the, the colorless blender color pencils that Nick sent me as part of the big uh, shipment of things from Amazon Wishlist, uh, the ones that were coming in later, well, that was one of them. And it certainly worked like a charm in smoothing out, at very least by comparison to how these colors looked when I laid them in. That's almost like the that's almost like how you do it with color pencils. It's almost like the, the hustle, of the color pencil industry. You got to do that, but then also you got to go and get the colorless blender to really smooth things out and really not make it look like it's just a bunch of scratching it right in there. At least that's what I see. And well, yes, bottoms up from Relentless. But remember, it's not just a bit of leg up there at the butt, but also a bit, but not, we don't see her full breast. It's not like those magazines like Club or whatever, where they would have the, the lady completely naked on the front of the on the magazine like that. And we've got Puma Fist right in there saying, what's up to the witches and warlocks? That's nice to see. Everyone say hello to each other. Everyone bring on in. Tell me what you think of this piece right here, my latest color pencil sketchbook yes the volume one of these this sketchbook series of doing these covers the, recreating them in color pencil with pen and ink are called uh cop they it is called the uh, color pencil sex pots nick bought the volume one this is volume two a work in progress this as you can see is near is a uh, got a bit more to complete once a week so let's see we've got uh, two four six eight ten 12, 14, 16, 18, 19, oh, uh, no, 19, 20, 22. We've got 23 weeks left on this one. But there are other ones. My Saturday one, that is only has a few more pieces left in there. That's done. And hello to Donnie Pearson saying hello again to everyone there. And yes, Donnie Pearson does confirm that this is Star Trek Day. And of course, uh, Nick is in the chat as well. Hello to you as well. We've got uh, lots of people coming on in. So everybody say hello to Anu. And of course, you would have seen the subscriber count spiked up a few. So now I'm up to 920. 
So let's go. Okay, today is the 8th. So that means we've got another three weeks to get to 1,000 before the month is out. Yes, and to Donnie. Hello to Donnie Pearson. It's Muffin time. And knowing uh, Donnie's love of the Power Rangers, well, you just might see me. You never know when I might be doing Power Ranger stuff. It could come. It could go. You don't know where or when. Or, of course, if Donnie uh, feels in the mood to get a Power Rangers piece straight from me, as his own personally commissioned piece, if he wanted to commission a Power Rangers piece, or if anyone else out there wanted to commission anything, remember that there is my art store. The link is pinned to the top of the chat right there. It's also the first link in the description below. So for that, of course, the if you want a co color commission, those are 25 plus shipping, and they're the last item in my color drawing categories. Or you can commission a pen and ink piece for $50 plus shipping, and they are the last item in my pen and ink illustration categories. Those are only 50 As This is the latest Wednesday one. You would have seen a few more. I'll show you right there. And uh, here's one. And what's this? Uh, I don't know. Dale Kaon passing out on his first stream seems to have beaten out the Queen's death and even Star Trek Day. Well, Star Trek Day, that's something I only kind of heard of in passing. Of course, the Queen's death is going to be all over the news headlines. I mean, there's a headline. Yeah, that passing, like that being brought up at the NFL's premier game. Yes. And yes, uh, Nick, I did see what the Geek Avenger said about uh, sending me something off my wish list. I saw that. Yep, that's the when I set up a stream, the chat's there for anyone to come in and start saying whatever. I did see that. Yeah, but there's a this the other ones I'll be showing here and a little showing these week by week. This is still a work in progress. <laughs> and yes, Dead Punk is correct about how it doesn't take much to take over Star Trek Day, considering what the franchise has done to itself. The, the big headlines I've been seeing when it comes to the YouTubers is talking about how the new Game of Thrones show, House of the Dragon, is doing better with its audience than Rings of Power when it comes to views and when it comes to like you know, customer reviews on Amazon or when it comes to per, per, uh, personal to people scores on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, that's uh, not much of a big uh, thing right there. And nope, I will not be skipping that. Uh, well, when it comes to that video... Well, I was, uh, b what do you think out there? L uh, Nick is questioning if I am skipping ladies, ladies, ladies this week. I am not going to skip out on drawing that, but since tomorrow is the video for my eight week, my eight months of progress, yes, Luke's quest eight months later, I will be doing a little video where it'll be eight, uh, describing eight months of progress in my fitness regime. So that one there. Uh, that one I did. That one's going to be guaranteed for Friday. Saturday is going to be my video for Michigan football. But of course, that's a night game. So it'll be a preview video. And uh, yes, Nick, this is this next version. Yeah, the, the color pencil sketchbook you got. This is the, the second volume of it. This is also a there's a lot more in progress. Like I said, there's another 23 weeks until this is done. But the sketchbook I do for Saturdays and Sundays, those on the, the Saturday one only has another two weeks of that left. Yes, I do a regular watercolor. There's a watercolor sketchbook I have that I do pieces with pen and ink and watercolor on Saturdays. You'll see them on my Instagram story. I post them. Those, uh, yeah, there's only two more weeks of that left. It's nearly completed. Yeah, that's uh, this is what there's going out there. But another thing I wanted to say was when I did the piece for Ohura, I did it a couple days ago. I believe it actually was yesterday. I did not show you the color piece because looking at the end of it, it came out looking my uh, the the color piece like this. And I think yeah, I'm just gonna let you linger on this and see you know perfectly why I think this is a failure and that I should toss this out. And hello to. She's in here. She's going to be here for a bit tonight, but she has to go and pick up food for her grandmother. Okay, I understand that. Uh, her, yes, her grandpa. Oh, her grandpa, not grandma. That's uh, I, I didn't see that exactly clearly, but here's one where now I want to leave it up to the audience. Should I tear this up for coloring it so badly? Uh, what do you do? Here's one. Uh, you know, who would want to go and make a, a, a $25 donation could get you this piece and I'll ship it to you? Or do you want me to tear it up? What you want to do is that if, if, if there's no one interested in uh, getting this piece, I'll just simply rip it to pieces. What do you want to do? And yes, uh, tall and sexy as Christopher is referring to Huron. And let's give her more a little bit of there. 
<laughs> yes, and even Nick is like, yeah, I see what you're saying, but since I screwed this up so badly, I think I should rip it up. Well, uh, Christopher is saying a ripping and a tearing, so all right. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Terran time's here. Um, Pumathus, no, I have never tried doing Bob Ross uh, technique landscape and oils. Well, Dead Punk says that he's not a fan of tearing up art, even if you think it's not good. Well, then, uh, Dead Punk, uh, what do you... Well, remember, if, uh, if you got the time, you got the cash, there's the link to my store. And since this isn't for available in the store, all you got to do is a 25 buck donation will get you this piece instead. If you don't feel like uh, tearing it, if uh, you don't feel like seeing me tear it up. And I see Relentless is also all happy and smiley to see we've got Nick, uh, we've got Nick in the chat. And everyone, of course, always loves Heron. So... And well, uh, oh, well, now uh, Christopher is asking if anyone's heard from Mildred. Well, I actually did get a, get a DM from her, and she's uh, moving to D.C. So, yeah, she's moving to D.C., and uh, yeah, we won't be uh, seeing her. Uh, we won't be seeing her around as consistently, and we won't be seeing her around in the streams at the very least, I think, because of what, you know, all the things that moving takes in. So, yeah, there is that. But that's... Uh, that's as far as I know. That's as much as I can say. That's as much because it's as much as I know. But what else to show? Uh, to take your minds off of how bad this is. Here, the color piece of Counter the Troy did earlier. I think maybe the body of the cat suit, maybe the coloring there. I could uh, right here. What's uh, what do you think of this? That I, I think I did a better job on this one. Like this one, I, I'm confident in. Um, and yeah, definitely with this one, it's a matter of a. Okay, we've got, we've got, you've got a minute right now. I'll give you two minutes now to say in the stream a simple yes or no to go and tear this up. We've got Vincenzo C in the chat as well. There, that's nice. Uh, Vincenzo talking about drawing a happy tree. That's his introduction to the stream. And also something I meant to show is uh, here. Yes, this little wall calendar I use to mark down how many pieces I finish in a day. This is a new one for September. Yes, seven days in. We're only, well, so I haven't arrived and marked down for tonight since I'm not finished with the day. I'm right there. And, uh, well, uh, well, Puma Fist says to not tear it up, and Dead Punk Gage also was saying not tear it up. But then, all right, well, what am I? All right, we've got a simple don't tear it up from Puma Fist. We've got a simple no from Dead Punk. So that's two votes for no. All right. Anybody else want to say? I mean, Christopher already said that's a. We've got one for yes and two for no. Here on, what's uh, relentless? What are your votes going to be for a yes or no? We're gonna. I wonder. While well, you do that, I also want to mention something else. I found it when I was uh, cleaning today, and uh, what I got here is this. It was the toy I was using for my Monday Night Wrestling show as Doomsday. I, I, I have uh, the small version and the big version of Big Van Vader. I was using the bigger version because I couldn't find this when I had all my wrestling figures I, uh, when I was doing the stream and then like I, I misplaced it. I found it in. <laughs> and well, uh, Huron saying she can go either way, but that's, uh, that's a sort of a... The, the number on the calendar, how many pieces I've done, well, the, uh, great drawing, drawings left to finish to get to great, that's 612. I, I've done 612 so far to get to 2,000. Yes, right there, great drawings left to finish, September, right there, yes, 612. That's how far I've gone. That's the, the gains I've made. But that's the... That's a matter of, you know, day in, day out work. Like I was saying to Orem Fay yesterday is day in, day out, day in, day out. That's the, the work it takes to go in. So, all right, we've got, a, we've got a one for yes, a two for no, and uh, Huron doesn't have a direct yes or no answer. So, uh, Relentless, what's yours? Because yeah, that th this one, the smaller ones, uh, this is what. Now that I found it, I'll be bringing back to using this one as Doomsday for my wrestling shows on Monday. Because yeah, the, this one's more evenly. It, it's it's just more in frame with the other wrestling figures that make up the most of the roster. So there's that. And uh, I I already said it. Yes. And uh, uh, 
the what's the number on your calendar now and what after good is great and what's after great well i'm thinking once i get to after great maybe then uh perfect you know after i get to 2000 that means okay now i'm on to the level of great and maybe then it'll be 2000 great pieces to get to perfect that'll be a that could be the one yes and hello to comic talks with pops van zent coming into the stream great to see you there yes the the number i'm up to 612 drawings and that's uh, to once I get to 2000, then I'm on to the level of great. And Pops Van Zant, now, now that you're into the stream, we want to know this piece of Ahura. I don't like the, uh, I, I, I went too dark with the coloring on this, and I'm thinking, should I tear this up or should I not? What do you think? To now. So now that we've got Van Zant and Relentless still hasn't said a yes or no, because I, I, Everybody in the stream right here to say whether I should tear this up or keep it and then put it in the store. What what do you think out there? What is your and the well Puma Fist says no to keep it. Well that's a Puma Fist already voted no. Uh let's see who else in here. Vincenzo hasn't given an answer yet. Right that uh now Nick, what's uh what would you say, yes or no? Because that's uh, uh, everybody to vote in there. And now, uh, and uh, Vagabond, De Vagabundo Devon says, I do actually have Copic markers and I do use those. Yes. Most of the coloring I do. Uh, well, Vincenzo says uh, no. He says, okay, so we have three votes for no. And uh, we've got In a Disguise coming back in. That's great to see. Well, the uh, Pumafus, why do you think you should tear it up? Because uh, I don't like, I think I did, uh, I did the coloring wrong. And Vincenzo C says uh yeah that he's getting a blackface vibe the way i did it i think i did it too uh, dark and with the lips i yeah it, it does it does almost look like it, I, I drew her in blackface i the coloring i did it looks like it's it's a someone in blackface as a hura and i'm not into that yes yeah, so like christopher saying it looks like a sambo piece uh, it certainly does yeah well nick says okay so we have nick and christopher uh all right nick and christopher say to tear it up uh, Comic Talk says, well, I, I think that's when it's for tearing it up. So we've got, now we're tied. Uh, yeah, In the Disguise says off. So uh, In the Disguise, is that a vote for yes to tear it up? Because uh, uh, Nick says yes. Christopher says yes. There was another vote for yes. I, uh, uh, Vincenzo says Mocha is my best bet. And Dead Punk, I never do anything digitally. That's, uh, I have a rule against digital art. That's why I don't, uh, well, then, uh, well, so in a disguise, do you say, should I tear it up? Because, all right, well, the, well, yeah, Nick is, uh, he's, uh, he's laughing about the blackface Bible. It does at the, at the end of it. I mean, and dead punk says that's fair, but that's, uh, yeah. And it's, it's one of the major things where like the older generation of comic artists, they don't do work digitally because doing whatever it is, if it's, you know, covers or if it's actual interior pages, that's then a physical piece of art they can go and sell. Well, in a disguise says, don't tear it up. All right. Well, Vincenzo, if you like the booty, well, there's the link to the store pinned to the chat and you can make a $25 donation. I'll ship this to you. It'll be the same as buying it. Arg, arg! Everybody cheats Vincenzo like a pirate. He's a bit of a salty dog out there. Oh, he's going out there for the bit of the scurvy. Out there, mateys. If if we treat him like a pirate, maybe then he'll go and make the donation to take care of it, since he likes the booty. But I'm still stuck when it comes to now. We have more votes for tearing it up. But if there's people out there who are interested in it, the. And uh, yes, uh, Vincenzo is a, a booty man. <laughs> uh, the, Christopher is joking. If I, if you do, do, if you make the donation to buy this, I'll send it to you, and uh, uh, and also I'll get you fried chicken to go with it. I mean, the, the way the coloring looks, yeah. And uh, Nick brings up yes. In a disguise says no, so no on the tearing. She says, uh, uh, the end of this guy says, no on tearing it, but not to sell it. Well, then, if I'm not going to tear it up and I'm not going to sell it, it's just going to sit around. Well, Pumafist tells me to stop worrying about what other people think. Well, 
I mean, if there's somebody's out there who would want to get it, but all right. Uh, okay, you've got another four minutes to vote on the life of this piece, whether to tear it up or not. Because uh, that's not something I will. Well, Puma Fist and Huron are saying to not worry about what other people think, but the same Ray, I really think mm, I when I got. Vincenzo says to make it my avatar. Well, I'm planning on updating my avatar eventually to be a much more flattering picture of myself. Well, Christopher also brings up how artists are very insecure. You all need you know, there, there, there is that observation as well. But okay, it's like, what do I do? I, I, I initially had the idea of I was just going to go and immediately tear it up, but then the thought crossed my mind of, oh, God, no, what's next? Maybe someone went out there. And when, and uh, as we're talking about all this, something far more horrific than this piece just showed up. Uh, the advertisement for I, I've got the I've got Thursday night football on my uh, on my TV right now, and they just advertised Halloween ends. So there's that. <laughs> and now in a disguise says to burn it. But uh, I mean, okay, so. I thought it was a simple yes or no, but Huron won't give an exact vote. And in a disguise now, it was first saying, oh, don't, don't sell it. Don't uh, tear it up. And now I was saying burn. What? what? Oh, now it's, I left it up to the audience. And well, now we've got, okay, we've got one vote for burn. We've got a second vote for uh, Christopher. What does Disco Inferno mean? You're saying to burn it? Uh, what's the third? That's the one you want to. Okay, so we've got now instead of tearing it up, we got votes to burn it. Oh, well, it goes burn, but now here on goes back to saying either way on it. Uh, I don't. Oh Lord, I think this is why there are people out there who say that democracy is a mistake because I leave it up to the vote, and now no one is uh, no, no one out there is doing this. Uh, not, not now. Now the vote is all confused. But pull a fist with a. Uh, well, if it's remember for anybody out there who doesn't uh, do, who does not think it's worthy of destroying or burning, you've got the option to buy it from the store. In the disguise, saying I'm crotch hurt, sitting on the defense. And yep, I've been I have the game on, and I did see the Rock walking out with his uh, know your role theme and doing the thing. Well, the, it makes sense because the Rock was out there. Do, uh, Every every single commercial break or every like third commercial break is advertising the Black Adam movie, and uh, I only just noticed now. Even though uh, Halloween Ends has a deal where it's also going to be available on the Peacock uh, Premium, you'd think Halloween Ends would also be uh, they would be showing that more. But I know now just looked up and saw it for the first time. And uh, well, Donnie, what do you think, uh, Donnie? This piece, do you think I should keep it or destroy it? Because I do not like the uh, the coloring at the end. It looks like I, I did a... It looks awful. And, well, Donnie's watching it on Seattle's King 5. Well, that's... Uh, well, that's... Uh, I think that... That's the... Uh, is that the NBC... That's got to be the NBC affiliate up there in Washington. But I'm, uh, I'm looking at this, and I'm still... Like, I don't think, uh, I think it's really a mistake. I think I should really t tear it up. I'm um, well, uh, yes, she's darker than Wendley Snipes. And even if it, uh, oh yeah, we're going to leave it up to the vote on Donnie. Nick is now proposing to Donnie to give a time either. Break the call. Should we rip up this piece or should I not? And Green Ranger for the win from here on. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I can't ask Oprah. I don't have Oprah on standby to give the message. So, well, the time has passed. Vincenzo, yes, darker than Winsley Snipes. But Donnie, should I tear this up? Well, we've got Inner Disguise now wants me to burn it. What, uh, Donnie, you're the tie, you're the tiebreaker. You got to vote on this. You got to say whether this piece is to be destroyed or to be kept. Because I, this is why I'm doing this. It's up to the audience. But the uh, and Jackie the Joke Man and Hank the Angry Drunken Dwarf are not around. I wish they were. And Dead Punk says to just do what I think is best. Well, since I'm not getting a, I'm not getting a proper. Uh, since we still are waiting on Donnie to give an answer. All right, here you go. Here we are.
There we go. There we are. Shattered into pieces. And now uh, you can all expect a uh, community post about this later on. I'm not going to throw these pieces out immediately. I'm going to show. Uh, um, I know there was that thing. I think it was like a year ago or two years ago where there was something that uh, it was a Scarlet Witch piece that uh, Frank Cho drew and he ripped it up. Well, that's what I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to show this later because I think I would. Hold on. But to show you a piece I am far more confident in. I will display, once again, if I can get it out from under my calendar, right here. Yes, the Count of the Troy piece in color, I think I did better on this one. Because the, the I think of all the different suits she wore. Well, Vincenzo calls this one lovely, yes. Well, and remember, we were fence-sitting and voting on what was the life about that piece with, uh, with Nichelle Nichols. But here, I am confident about this one. And this is one that is not up in the store yet. The Star Trek piece I've done so far is not up in the store yet. But any, uh, but this one, the ones you see in these streams before they're posted for sale, a donation of either twenty-five for a color one or thirty for a uh, pen and ink one will be. Uh, you do that in the store. The links at the top of the chat or in the description below. There is a. Uh, well, Tumafus says that I just lost him because destroying art because of the threat. I don't destroying it from the threat of cancel culture. I'm destroying it because I didn't like it. I personally did not like that it looks that it looks like a minstrel show. I'm not scared of cancel culture once uh, whatsoever. And so now Pumafus saying that he's out. And, uh, well, yes, Vincenzo does bring up about uh, Wesley Snipes and Tu Wong Fu. Well, yeah, there is that. Uh, that I think that was one of the first, if not the first, uh, film that Wesley Snipes was in they ever saw was Tu Wong Fu, because uh, I yeah that was uh, I remember Patrick Swayze or the in a disguise wants to know how does she get in and out of that outfit? Well, if you see on the show and especially now with the way the the 4K restoration the, those 4K box sets the four. The, you know, there's those season box sets and also on whatever streaming service that has them on like Paramount Plus or other things like that, you'll see in the back of the suit, there's just a simple little zipper. It's just a zipper in the back when you see her, just a subtle, just pull that down and then they pull her in. And also a major difference between this famous uh, cat suit and the Seven of Nine one in Star Trek Voyager was the Seven of Nine cat suit also had a, a corset built into it. The corset built into it also was much more constrictive and the very tight. It had a high collar. This has that low cut collar so she could really breathe more easily while the high collar on the original silver cat suit for the seven of nine, that was so tight that I think it wound up, it, it was rumored, it was reported to have gone and uh, caused the actress to faint. Well, Vincenzo, I do have my seven of nine artwork in my store under pop culture illustrations and pop culture color drawings. You'll find a seven of nine piece. And well, Dead Punk Gage, the first pieces, the first films of Wesley Snipes he remembers are Major League and New Jack City. It's uh, it's it's interesting the trajectory of Wesley Snipes acting wise. He went from being in ensemble comedies mostly about sports like Wildcats, that football moment with Goldie Hawn, and then Major League, and somehow from there on the back of Major League and being the real breakout actor in that, he then goes and gets to be Nino Brown in New Jack City. And well, Huron has to go. Uh, she's saying bye. That's uh, nice to see. Uh, it's, it's nice to see when I, I've got my audience that is coming and going when they say. And uh, well, and Vincenzo, also, White Men Can't Jump is a favorite film of his. That is nice to hear. Very nice to hear. And yes, uh, bye to Huron. Great to see you soon. And In a Disguise brings up Blade. Oh, yes, uh, Blade. That was uh, a thing of beauty. And uh, Nick uh, loves White Men Can't Jump. I've uh, not seen that in a long time. Uh, I've I remember uh, I, I, I I no no actually scratch that it's just I, I I've seen it but not really as recently as I would have liked it to be I think like maybe eight months ago nine months ago or something I went and saw the uh, I, I went and saw White Men Can Jump I I mean I did watch it before as a child but talking about watching the film recently like in the past couple of weeks or week or so I have been rewatching comedies I hadn't seen in a while like Stripes and Dude Where's My Car. Like I remember, it just occurred to me uh, tonight that I had not seen in a long time 
uh, the, what's the, and now, of course, I forget the film. I had not seen Encino Man in a while. I not, yes, I had not seen Encino Man in a long while. That's a, a weird, I, I don't, it was just another, well, I think because I have Hulu, and on Hulu, I saw that uh, one of the th movies that they're promoting is Son-in-Law. That was, that was the big uh, Polly Shore follow-up to, he was in Encino Man. He wasn't the lead in Encino Man, but that was his big breakout. That he was like the big scene stealer, and then from there he got to be a lead. And starting with the son-in-law, or yes, the 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 mom from the Spy Kids movies is farm girl who goes out to college, and she winds up getting a relationship with Polly Shore, who brings her to introduce him to her family during Thanksgiving. Yes, that that one is a. Uh, that, that there's that, but I, I actually have seen that more recently. Son in law, in Cino Man, no, of course, Biodome. That's uh, I haven't rewatched that one in a while, but that one is far more in my in, in memory. In the Army Now, that's another one I've I've, I've actually rewatched that more recently than the in Cino Man. But yeah, the another one is uh, the other one he did, Jury Duty. That's yeah, the the one where. It may have been when his career was going down as a leading man, but at the same time, for being in a film with Pauly Shore, it was also an early film role for Stanley Tucci. It shows you it's not a matter of where you start your career, it's how you keep it going. And, well, Tucci is now ongoing, respected character actor, and I think the earliest film role I remember seeing him in was uh, in uh, Jury Duty. And, uh, actually, no, wait, scratch that. Before that, there was that weird time in the early to mid 90s where Nicolas Cage was trying to be more of like a conventional leading man, like a romantic lead. And the one film he did, It Could Happen to You, where he's the, he's the cop who promises he'll, uh, if he wins the lottery, he'll split the winnings with a waitress. And then he actually does win the lottery. And I remember the, yeah, the, the, the co star of the waitress is Bridget Fonda. And her like ex husband is this uh, douchey actor, and that was Stanley Tucci in an early role for him. That may have been his first movie, but he also had an early role in uh, a Jury Duty. Which uh, uh, one thing though, I do remember about Jury Duty, Jury Duty vividly, and really now I'm a little more reluctant about rewatching it. Is I remember in that in the beginning, Polly Shore is supposed to be a male stripper. Yes. Uh, now, now I'm thinking, okay, no, thank you. And yeah, Christopher brings up Biodome. I yeah, I watched Biodome so much as a child. It's one of those childhood films. Yeah, where I think that's one where when it comes to people who shit on Polly Shore, still they'll secretly admit to liking Biodome, or they'll watch it in secret and they know they yeah, they love Biodome. There, there are I know that uh, out of his filmography, like that in uh, in Cino Man seemed to actually have like cult followings. Well, I know that Biodome's become something of a cult film. And well, Encino Man, that was one that was legitimately popular and liked. I mean, yeah. The, the, well, remember, that one also is not quite the same because he's not the lead. You also have Brendan Fraser in it. I see also now we got a. And Dead Punk brings up Tia Carrere in Dirty Duty. Oh, yeah. Well, she was. Well, that, that was when she was still working. She was really sexy in that. And if you remember, she was the villainess in True Lies. And yeah, she. How, how does one go from being in a big. Uh, you know, big budget Arnold James Cameron film like True Lies to your career kind of going downward into stuff like Relic Hunter. Well, being in True Lies and following that up with Jury Duty, yeah. Now from there, no wonder your next movie is going to be uh, in High School High with John Lovitz. If anyone remembers that, that was that was that that, that John Lovitz movie that was like a parody of those uh, teacher going to the ghetto school and making the uh, and making the the students uh, better. You know, movies like Lean on Me or uh, Dangerous Minds, Th though those kind of movies, yeah, that that's what High School High was making fun of. <laughs> and who else? Uh, and Vincenzo brings up seeing Nick first in Valley Girl, Nicolas Cage. Yes, Nicolas Cage is, is uh, the first time he was credited as Nicolas Cage was the movie Valley Girl. It was not his first film, of course. His first film was Fast Times at Ridgemount High, where he was, uh, of all people... He was uh, he was one of Judge Reinhold's buddies who barely spoke. I think he only like speaks and like group him and uh, uh, Reinhold's other friends, but you never really hear him get it like a clean line by himself. And he was still Nicholas Coppola. And then he decided to go by the stage name Cage. And his first uh, Nicholas Cage role was the being the male lead in Valley Girl. 
or he's supposed to be like a punk rocker. That's uh, that. That's another one where I remember seeing it and loving it, but it's I've not seen it in the longest time. Like that. There's one I had heard of, but only finally saw recently that was really a lot more stranger and unexpected than I was. Uh, it, it really threw me for a loop and being a lot of a lot of goofy, crazy twists and turns called They're Playing With Fire, where uh, B-movie sex goddess uh, Sybil Danning is this uh, woman who seduces. She's a college professor who seduces one of her students into being involved in this uh, scheme that uh, her and her husband have cooked up. Are they going to use him as the fall guy for a scam to get their... Uh, the, the, the mother of uh, the husband to die in order to get her inheritance because they don't want to wait around to see her just you know die of natural causes. They just, but then it winds up going into this thing where it turns out that there was a, a long lost bastard son who is actually the heir to their inheritance who wants to now go and kill everybody getting in the way of him. And at the same time, also the, uh, the, the college student that uh, civil dating hoodwinked with sex to get involved in all this she he also now is getting implemented in this uh, murder investigation about the the, the grandmother so it's it goes through all these bizarre leaps i thought it would be another like 80s teen sex comedy where just uh you know teenage guy you know college high school whatever gets uh, his chance at a hot older woman like he's always fantasized about but then it starts to go wrong or things go wrong or then you know the the fear of the husband uh, finding out and getting you know revenge comes into play it really doesn't but all the other bizarre twists and turns like it's some kind of james n kane double indemnity kind of story of or like body heat really makes it off the weird hmm. and uh, also vicenzo brings up cajun bat lieutenant and asks steven seagal that question in a disguise about uh well yes the uh, steven seagal that boy is spreading to death says in a disguise Yes, that is a, he, I think he just might live on pie, Steven Seagal. The way it looks like it, where now he's barely able to either, in his movies, stand still or sit down. If you notice that, he can only ever stand still or sit down and move his hands like a little. It, it looks like he's a little kid slap fighting in the back of a car over a toy. Him and his little brother are in the back of a car over a toy. They're... Slapping, slappy, slap happy. Oh, slap happy. Slappy the slap happy squirrel from Animaniacs. If anyone else remembers that besides me, the, the Animaniacs people mostly remember the Warner Brothers and the Warner Sister, but all the other characters like Kitty, Ka Katie Kaboom and uh, Pinky and the Brain. Those ones, yeah. I don't know if you remember those well. <laughs> her left leg seems a lot bigger, says Inna Describes. Oh, no, no, wait, her right leg. Well, that's because she's got the legs twisting. She's doing the little akimbo to have the uh, what's called the S line. When having a, a female figure, her body sway. Yeah, you got you, you to gotta bring that feminine curvature in there somewhere or another. Even if you have a woman in an action pose, you should, still should really... Have it dynamic and energetic in some way or another. Really make it twist. Really make it, you know, move and flow. Cur sloping is really what I would say when it comes to having the sloping forms of the female figure. That's what it's got to go. That's what you got to really have. Whether it's the more sexier kind of pose like this or if it's something where it's off, you know, action. Action, action, action. Action Jackson, which... That's another one I saw. I didn't grow up seeing Action Jackson. I finally did get to see it a few years ago. Really liked it, but... And especially because that's one that's set right here in the city of Detroit, right there. For our Relentless is in the chat there. And Guilty Gearhead coming on in. Well, the Inner Disguise says it looks like that she has a thunder thigh. Well, that's the only thigh you really get to see, so it's not quite the same as if... Like, if I just had her standing straight up, that would be, or if you had, or in a curve, in a more curved kind of pose with like one leg up and the other like laying the ground so you could really compare the shape of the legs. And like with Guilty Gearhead right here, let's uh, hailing to everybody and hail everyone back to Guilty Gearhead for being in the stream. Yes, we got a nice set of hellos for you because we love you in here. And I'm going to go and get these little... It was, it's not really like she has a tiara back there. 
like the, the way her hair is framed, it almost kind of reminds me of like Peg Bundy. Like if you remember, yeah, the, the Peg Bundy, that really large, almost like a helmet of hair that she had on Married with Children. The one that actually looks better in like cartoon form as a drawing than does on real life. Because if you remember, there were some spoofs of Married with Children done on The Simpsons. And yeah, they, they did Married with Children. They showed it in a cartoon form. And there, and then also in when there was the Married with Children comic book, which yes, there was a Married with Children comic book. It ran for like 20 something issues in the 90s. It's up there, it's visible. And yeah, it's uh, the, the way that the characters look, at least with how that big helmet hair looks, it's actually better in cartoon form than a person. The, yes, well, we thank you. And you actually missed it, Guilty Gearhead, because I went and took a piece I had done with uh, Nichelle Nichols in color that I, I tore to pieces right here. Yes. Donnie is very much the nice greeter. I like, a, I like everybody to greet everyone else. That's what we're doing here. We're here to build the audience so everybody's coming come in here. And uh, I, I, th I think it was a Poison that did that song, Nothing But A Good Time. Yes, that's what we're. That, that's what I always aspire. I, I want it nothing but a good time. That is where we are doing, where we are going. Nice, we got the little com badge there, and oh yep, I think in the pencil form I really messed up her uh, breast right there. Now let's go and do a bit around the crotch. Nice. Where's the? Uh, what do you think uh, if I should do another line for her other breast under here or if I should not? What do you think? And Nick is wondering, so uh, so since you've been drawing women for a year now, what now do you think is the most difficult part of drawing them? I would say uh, the most difficult part in drawing a female is the really it's actually the, the hips and the waist. The, the real part of doing the female form really well is the, the face and the hips and the waist. That's Those are really major. The here, this area, and the face are the parts where you got to really draw them. That That's the area where if you do not do those accurately, then either it looks terrible or it's going to look more masculine. And in a disguise, wants to know who was the artist who could not do feet for Marvel? That was Rob Liefeld. Rob Liefeld was the guy who either got made fun of for how the feet were so disproportionately small, or he would have characters stand and they'd the, in the panel they'd be cut off at like the knees, or if you did see them standing in full figure, there'd be smoke or rocks. And Vincenzo says, uh, "I've I'm good with the Mons Venus." I'm, I hope that I'm good at the Mons Venus because, as I said, when it comes to the hips and the waist and the hips, the waist, the bust, and the face, those are really the four areas. you got to really get those accurate. you got to really do those right. And, we'll, uh, and yes, Nick, it was Rob Liefeld who was the Marvel artist who had trouble with feet. And yes, Christopher, we get it. You want the Mons penis. We, we know that already. We hear that all the time. And uh, yes, uh, the, in a disguise, they did make a joke about it in the Deadpool in Deadpool Two, uh, about the coked out comic book artist who has a, 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 a phobia of drawing feet. I think that was something in the Kelly Jones covers during the Batman Nightfall storyline. Was the way he drew? Well, Kelly Jones was the kind of artist who really drew in a star style that's more influenced by horror, like Mister uh, Bernie Wrightson. But when he went and did those covers during that time for the Batman Nightfall storyline, the covers there, the proportions and how he was doing them was intentionally done as like a, a spoof, a ridicule, a takedown, a satire of the 90s Marvel artists. I, I would say for sure on that one. That he was going in there, going in that way of thinking, OK, I'm going to go and do some uh, pieces for uh that like that <laughs> hmm. and yes in a disguise chris is the pegged it was uh you in a disguise did yes peg correctly <laughs> yes yes gay men do have needs christopher 
And Guilty Gear, it says, question for you. Is there a difference between what Nerd Roddick and other YouTubers are doing covering rings of power and hate watching? I'm not sure I understand the difference. Well, I think with uh, the difference between Nerd Roddick, what they're doing with the rings of power and hate watching, it's a matter of, well, really, I think when it comes to hate watching is that there's a difference between like audiences in mass uh, hate watching and somebody that likes like a YouTuber who watches it. And if anything, what those like neurotic or heels V babyface, those kind of channels are doing. If they're going out there, they're watching that show and they're doing like a stream or videos about it. And they're ridiculing something that is, you know, bastardizing a franchise. As we mentioned, I mean, I'm probably when it comes to YouTubers who have been talking about rings of power, I've done more than other YouTubers I've seen into going into detail about J.R.R. Tolkien's background and his life and his personal views and all that and how him, the kind of life he led, the kind of man he was, would definitely be in opposition to all these uh, you know, blue hairs and side shaves and what they're doing with the source material to just turn it into another you know, far left kind of political tract. Here was a guy who was, you know, a scholar, who was a professor at Oxford, who was a, a veteran officer and a gentleman, and he explicitly was against having any of his personal religious or political social views in his work. He even publicly called out and ridiculed some guy in Sweden who tried to per say that it was an anti-Stalin parable, Lord of the Rings. But with the difference there is that with what Nerd Roddick is doing, they're doing, they're watching something and they're ridiculing it with an inch of its life. And what, and just take a look at that. It, and it turns out that there's a bigger audience out there for watching people on YouTube ridicule this than there are for actually watching the show itself. If it's, you know, watching the rings of power, if, if there is a bigger audience out there and a more interactive, really more verifiable and more uh, well engaged with the content creator audience for ridiculing a product than the product itself, that's not really hate watching. That's a matter of really the, the kind of people who are passionate about the franchise and are really giving it to them, really sticking it to the man who are just completely just sullying everything they love so dearly if they're the kind of person who is a fan of this franchise and they're so intense about it and they're so dedicated to it that the kind of money that they would have been spending on this they would have been putting into really enjoying this and promoting this instead they're doing it as anti-promotion they're doing it where they're shitting all over these people they're getting an audience that's growing and really engaging and interacting with each other to put this pr crap down then really that's a far cry away from like Matt. If, if it was just the general public that is just watching this because they don't like it. And, uh, well, that's why I'm a not, uh, I'm not a guy out there. <laughs> and uh, Christopher is complaining about how I draw a uh, plenty of, uh, I draw plenty there, but he, he's serious about how male superheroes should have the bigger bulges, but we see plenty of tits. Well, uh, uh, Nick brings up, well, uh, Nick, in reference to me, let him draw what he wants, Christopher. He prefers to draw women. I mean, and yes, in a disguise, it is cold in the superhero universe. <laughs> and the Dead Punk doesn't even bother hate watching, and uh, their Guilty Gearhead says, thanks for explaining. But yes, I do aim to please. And yeah, when they first started, they ra they ranked all about how uh, it was an adaptation, which is, uh, it is a butchering of Tolkien. Yes, it is completely out there and going out there and completely, you're not just, it's not just the work itself. This is also a man's life's work. It's not just some like franchise that was just done in some kind of like group. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a product that's focus grouped. It's not a product that was made because there was uh, this, you know, social media front that was demanding this kind of representation. I mean, that's that the, the major difference between something like that uh, as something, uh, one of those kind of shows that's all focus groups in the entrance life and a work like Lord of the Rings. It was really a work of creative passion. And the Peter Jackson films, that was also a work of creative passion and what he wanted to do. So that's why, you know, I'm uh, not out there and... Uh, Oh, uh, Guilty Gearhead, when it comes to uh, Guilty Gearheads, bring up a response to In a Disguise about the lack of big bulges on superheroes. I was in the pool. Well, think about most of those characters are out there. Most of those superheroes, they're, a lot of them can fly. 
or they're out on big, you know, like super jets. It, the ones who can't fly, they still have like a plane involved. And a lot of the time they're out there in those super high intensity, you know, when it comes to the jet streams out there, when it comes to the altitude out there and the conditions, the weather conditions out there at those altitudes, there's going to be some shrinkage. It, it gets pretty cold just up there high enough into the sky where you're on a plane and there you go. And I'm serious about that one. I mean, you know, you see it, you hear it, you love it. But the thing about that Superman going all the way up and not to mention, he can also fly out into the vacuum of space, even if it's something only briefly. But still, that's not going to give you, uh, you know, compliment uh, uh, the kind of right conditions to really make you, you know, go out there and really be engaged in the bulge area. And, uh, right there. Uh, Christopher, of course, he brings up the porn parody Lord of the Anal Rings. And uh, yeah, yes, Christopher, like you, I do like bulges. Nick and Christopher, they do like the bulges, yes. And also, Nick, from what he's heard, the first two episodes were a letdown, and he's not into Lord of the Rings, so either way, he doesn't care. I mean, there is that. There's a simple matter of uh, another thing to consider is how much of the people out there really even are into Lord of the Rings in the first place. So on top of that, there's just the general audience that could have possibly been engaged in the franchise by Rings of Power by just making it something that was really a, a tribute and really adapting Tolkien well instead of what the people at Amazon are doing now. I mean, Jesus. Uh, when was it say that Amazon right now is doing a better job bringing back kids in the hall than what they're doing with uh, The Lord of the Rings? A Canadian sketch comedy show from the 80s and 90s is getting better, a better representation, a better revival through Amazon Studios than this. Yes, the, at the they ended the show in the mid 90s, like 1994. And now I, I'm not sure if they're really coming back and doing it as like a regular series or if it's just this like a little mini series revival of Kids in the Hall. But that show and I, it's on YouTube. I've been rewatching it. I'm up to season three and the show really does hold up. The, then the, but somehow that something that Lorne Michaels did on the side with a Saturday Night Live and that is getting a better shake and it's, it's yes and uh, hold there you are Councillor Troy oh you're just going around oh I'm just around oh captain I feel I sense there's great danger oh you think there's danger there's danger you cannot feel because I'm crushing your head I'm crushing your head I'm crushing your head oh look there's another one. Oh, you got Councillor Troy in cover. Oh, I'm crushing your head. I'm crushing your head. I'm crushing your head, Councillor Troy. And Orem Faye is in the channel. She's late, but yeah, she was uh, drawing. So uh, I understand. Well, if you're doing your own work and you're late to the channel, that's uh, I, I get it. You know, as long it's not a matter of you know, when you go, but it's not a matter of what time you get to the church as long as you go. Yes. And, uh, well, I can't really call this my church because I do not meet on uh, Sundays. I don't stream on Sundays. Like the NFL, uh, that's uh, something where I'm uh, – when it comes to NFL paraphernalia for my team, for the Lions, I'm looking at uh, the, the one major Detroit Lions paraphernalia I think I'll ever really need or ever really want is the Beverly Hills Cop 2 jacket. I've got that, so that's, you know, what I've got. That's what I want to wear. I'm okay with it. It's uh, something for me. That's what I want. But yeah, uh, I think. Uh, let me go and double check. And well, uh, here's one uh, in a disguise. Oh well, now we get the difference. The difference between why Rings of Power is shitting all over the legacy of the new uh, of of Tolkien, while uh, in Kids in the Hall and its revival is doing so much better. In a disguise brings up the detail of. Uh, Kids in the Hall, they have creative control over their show as part of the deal to bring it back. Because, yeah, there's something like... I know in the time it was a, a real, like, ahead of its time it, it, of how much, like, gay jokes there were and having an openly gay cast member to whom one of the big breakout characters in the show was his recurring character, Buddy Cole, who was, like, a nightclub owner, and he would do, like, all this gossip or talking about whatever. And since I mentioned the passing of Queen Elizabeth... 
one of the recent Kids in the Hall episodes I rewatched was one where it, the whole skit is a, correspond- is a correspondence between him and the Queen Elizabeth. And uh, from one queen to another. Yes, Scott Thompson, dead punk gauge. But here's a caveat to Scott Thompson. He may be an openly gay performer and most of his material is about his sexuality. But the difference is, is that he remembers to make his material actually have setups and punchlines. He actually has jokes. That's the major difference between him and Hannah Gadsby. And also in appearances on podcasts and in recent versions of his skit where he's done stand-up where it's just as himself or he's done stand-up where he's in character as his breakout character, Buddy Cole, and he lays in to the Me Too movement. He lays in to the idea of, you know, uh, of diversity casting and diversity hiring. And yes, as Dead Punk Gage, the difference between Scott Thompson and, you know, Hannah Gatsby or those uh, or the, the millennials, I am this sexual preference, thus you must celebrate me. Is Thompson? He not only is he actively going out there and really trying to do jokes. He does material that is actively ridiculing the Me Too movement and the uh, and the whole thing of I'm supposed to be something that's proud because of I'm in this diversity checkbox or that. Well, and, and yes, Nick, I would really recommend anybody who hasn't seen a Kids in the Hall. Uh, the, the humor there is really surreal. And there's a reason that two of the five guys and kids in the hall, they were writers of Saturday Night Live for like a year before the show Kids in the Hall happened. And it just didn't work. They left the show after that one year and they went back to the other three guys and the five of them went. And Lauren Michaels, in a rare bit of really judging talent well, saw, okay, these guys deserve their own show. And there he went to the CBC. And there's something else that in the state-funded CBC, they would not be happy with today. A skit in one of the later episodes of season two is a skit about where they flat out tell them about how this show is funded by taxpayers. And the whole skit is, screw you, taxpayer. They get their entire studio audience to yell out, screw you, taxpayer. And in the corner, they have a little price counter counting up how much of the how much it costs to take this skit, how much it costs to have actors on stage. They get Scott Thompson to walk on stage and he says, screw you taxpayer. There's a, the whole studio audience, how much it costs to get them to say, screw you taxpayer. They get somebody in the crew to say, screw you taxpayer and how much it costs to have that guy there. You know, the, and yeah, that, and between Scott Thompson's material being the kind of gay man who is not, of the, you know, celebrate me because sexual preference, he's out there and doing just as much as material of going in there and going against that and asking the women in me too, are you fucking crazy? I mean, it's, that's why when it comes to the accusation stuff, I just as much, if it's something that's out there in the press and automatically they are cheering and demanding, they're, they're cheering the victim and demanding that whoever is the accused being thrown away, if it's, it, it, just as much if it's somebody who is there on the left, if it's a Senator Cuomo or his brother on CNN, if it's uh, Al Franken or if it's even um, uh, uh, or Chris Matthews, I automatically am suspicious of it and think, OK, because you get there and that stuff gets talked about. But the thousand and fifty people who had a group suit against the University of Michigan over the team doctor, these thousand and fifty people accusing him of molestation and it does not get the round the clock TV coverage like it got with uh, with Jerry Sandusky. I'm thinking, oh, and, and not to mention, where is the HBO movie about the scandal or, or with um, Al Pacino in a fat suit playing Bo Schimbeckler? I wonder. But uh, now, actually, when it comes to that, I'm actually a little more interested now in the Kids in the Hall revival, considering that that one from, you know, that they have creative freedom. So that's why I'm hearing good things about the new Kids in the Hall, because, well, that is the difference. People who the people who made the show and made it really tick and wanted to continue to prosper and really do it like it originally was, it's a real mutual understanding of they respect their fans and they want to do something that's going to make this bankable audience work. So it's the exact opposite of Netflix and the He-Man thing. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Dead Punk Gage says his favorite uh, kid was Kevin McDonald. I liked him. 
he was like, a, I mean, looking at him, he looks like what I imagine all the writers on Seinfeld look like. He, he looks like another one of those New York Jewish comedians who's really funny. His material's good, but him, like him on stage doing stand up, is not quite as like entertaining. So he winds up doing probably as much work, either just doing stand up, you know, like doing real touring stand up, but not being like a big name who transitions into movies, or he's a guy who becomes like a writer on those shows, like Seinfeld or other big shows. And, uh, Oh, yes. The Eradicator. Tremble before the Eradicator. Vincenzo brings up Mr. Bruce McCullough was his favorite. Well, the, yeah, the, who else? The, we got, who's your favorite kid from Kids in the Hall? Because Gelf Walker, let's see, uh, Gelf Walker's here in the chat right there. Now, let's go. I'm going to wonder, who is uh, your, who is your favorite member of the Kids in the Hall? Uh, for me, I, I would say it's Bruce McCullough. I would hands down say Bruce McCullough out of all of them. That's the one because the there not to mention it wasn't just in front of the camera he was funny also uh, most of those pre-taped skits that was that was a uh, Bruce McCall as well and of course there was uh, Bobby the Bobby with the mullet he was the rock kid the kid with the mullet who he had a duel with the devil with his guitar there's the other one where he writes the poem about and he has the girlfriend the girlfriend who was eventually the replacement in Dax on the last year of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, there's the skit he does where he's doing the guitar. His girlfriend broke up with him. Laura, yes. And then, then country western music. I understand it now. And but then she comes back and oh yeah, I, I, my father said he liked you. That's why he broke up. Oh, I was just kidding. Oh yeah. And there's the Bruce number one. Okay, there's the. Well, now out there we've got uh, Bruce McCullough for. Uh, uh, for Vincenzo and me, Kevin McDonald is the best, according to Dead Punk. Who's your favorite member of Kids in the Hall? Well, uh, and now with that, I see that we have ourselves a finished uh, Council of Troy right here. So I want to thank, uh, well, there. Oh, yeah. I don't remember his name, but Dead Punk does bring up the, the kid who talks a lot. The kid with the big glasses, who I think was supposed to be autistic. That, yeah, that that weird kid would just stand there and incessantly talk to you. When I lived in Florida, there was a kid I knew when I'd go to Barnes and Noble, and he was like that. That that kid Bruce McCullough played. But yes, uh, we have a finished uh, Couch of the Troy here. So I want to thank everyone for watching. Remember to subscribe if you're new, and if you're a returning viewer, check that you still are subscribed. And besides liking and sharing, the best way to support my work is to shop on my online art store. There is the link pinned to the top of the chat, and it's the first link in the description below where pen and ink pieces like this are 25 bucks. Color pieces like this of Council of the Troy are 20 bucks. I have sketchbooks available for sale. They are 25 bucks like this one. Yeah, the, if you want a sample, here's a sketchbook that's a work in progress for my regular Wednesday piece. These are, this is my regular Wednesday sketchbook where I am doing, a, I'm doing Playboy and Sports Illustrated covers in color pencil right here. Yes, this is not quite done yet, but I have other finished sketchbooks that are for sale. They're all 25 bucks a piece, no matter what size or shape they're in. So besides that, you can also commission me. You can commission a, a, a pen and ink illustration for 50 bucks. Those pen and ink illustrations are the last item in my illustration categories. A color drawing like this, they are for sale. The commissions are 25 bucks a piece plus shipping, and they're the last item in my color drawing categories, or you can commission a trading card. And trading card commissions are the last item in my store, uh, in the last item in my in my coffee sleeve super babes categories. And those coffee sleeves are only $7.50. Besides that, the first thing in my uh, category is donations. You can donate any dollar amount you like to support me in any denomination. Donations come from anywhere around the world. And remember, whatever you buy, if you buy one thing or several things, it only comes with a flat $5 shipping and handling fee. Besides that, you can also go and uh, remember, if you live outside of America and you want to buy a commission, my store cannot receive orders for items outside of the USA. So what you're going to have to do is simply uh, don't, uh, add up your, the items you want, uh, the prices for them in US dollars, include another $25 US, and make, make that purchase as a donation. If you make your don't purchase as a donation, then your items will, uh, yes, that will be purchased and they will ship the next day. 
So until then, remember, I'm going to be live to, again tomorrow night at 10. I want to thank everyone new and returning, all for coming in. Let's hope we all can get more people interested in kids in the hall. Of course, do not forget, I'm going to, uh, besides being live again tomorrow night at 10, I'll have a new upload at 6 p.m. Eastern. My Luke's Quest eight months later will be there. So remember, until then, felines, slam it, lick it, suck it, and see you, Space Cowboy.